Good afternoon. Uh, can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is portfolio questions on COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R during the relevant question. I call question number one, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government how its policies across government will support people living in West Scotland region to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President, officer, the COVID recovery strategy sets out an ambitious plan for Scotland's recovery that is focused on creating a fairer future, particularly for people most affected during the pandemic. Our plan for recovery includes supporting the recovery of our public services to ensure they meet the needs of people across Scotland. For example, our NHS recovery plan is backed by over a billion pounds of investment. We are also focusing on creating good green jobs and fair work to support our recovery, and regional economic partnerships are central to achieving this. The West Scotland region benefits from a range of regional economic partnerships and deals, including the Glasgow Region Deal, the Ayrshire Growth Deal and the Argyle and Butte Rural Growth Deal. These will see transformational investment in projects to support long-term, sustainable and inclusive growth as we recover from the pandemic. Katie Clark. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, the West of Scotland has some of the worst poverty and deprivation in Scotland and the UK. The pandemic has taken away hope and opportunities, particularly for young people. What can the Scottish Government do to bring high quality apprenticeships, particularly to those in some of the most deprived areas? Deputy First Minister. I think the first thing to do is to say that I agree with the analysis and the focus of the COVID recovery plan that Katie Clark has put forward, because at the heart of the COVID recovery strategy is the tackling of endemic poverty and particularly child poverty. These um, issues have become worse during the pandemic and those who were um, suffering pr prior to the pandem pandemic suffered more during the pandemic and they must be the focus of our attention afterwards. I assure uh, Katie Clark that at the heart of our strategy is about supporting uh, young people to achieve good outcomes. One of the best outcomes they can achieve is an apprenticeship. So we are supporting a range of different companies and organisations in the Work Through Skills Development Scotland to make sure that apprenticeships are available in all localities within Scotland and particularly in areas of deprivation. I also recognise that some young people who have experienced poverty may require additional support to help them to gain access to some of these opportunities. And that will be available through ventures such as MCR Pathways, for example, on mentoring, uh, and also through other ventures to support young people achieve their potential. A supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This morning I was delighted to attend the official opening in Largs of a new 122 home council housing development backed by a £7.3 million grant from the Scottish Government. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that constructing new council housing helps drive economic recovery in the west of Scotland and that the £68 million granted to North Ayrshire Council over the last five years alone, with more than £81 million over the next five years, is in sharp contrast, contrast to the sum of precisely zero provided by the Labour Lib Dem Scottish Executive during its entire eight years in office. Deputy First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I, I, I agree with Kenneth Gibson that uh, the construction of affordable housing and doing that within the uh, local authority sector is an essential part of our approach to recovery. Uh, the Government has demonstrated since 2007 a commitment to this agenda with over 105,000 affordable homes delivered since that period, uh, over 73,000 of which were for social rent and nearly 17,000 of them council homes. The Government is committed to delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, uh, of which 70 per cent will be available for social rent and 10 per cent in our remote rural and island communities. So these uh, commitments are part of an, an ambitious investment package of around £18 billion that will create 15,000 jobs each year, some of which, of course, will be in the sectors that Katie Clark has just asked me about. And supplementary, Pam Gozel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many SMEs in the West of Scotland region are experiencing severe skill shortages, partly due to a lack of capacity to oversee and funding training and apprenticeships. The Scottish Government claims success on its reskilling initiatives, yet the number of modern apprenticeships offered in both East Dumbartonshire 
and West Dumbartonshire dropped by almost half from 219 to 20 to 220 to 2021. Therefore, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why the Scottish Government have decided to cut college funding at a time when reskilling will be so important to the recovery from the pandemic? Deputy First Minister. Uh, first of all, I think it would be helpful if I put on the record the fact that obviously the number of modern apprenticeships fell in the years that Pam Gosso refers to because of the pandemic and the fact that the country was in lockdown. It was very difficult to enable these opportunities to be taken up in that context. And of course, over the preceding four years, we had seen steady incremental growth and the government was actually, without the pandemic, would have achieved the target of 30,000 modern apprenticeships, which was the target for the financial year 2021, which would have been achieved had it not been for the pandemic. We were at over 29,000 in the previous year. So um, that explains the situation. Obviously, the government is committed to sustained investment in the sector because the Pam Gosar puts a fair point to me. Uh, SMEs need to have uh, access to a reliable stream of, um, uh, of new entrants uh, with the appropriate skills, and that's very much the focus of the apprenticeship programme. And we take that forward by working with Scottish, uh, Skills Development Scotland and the college sector, who do superb work uh, in making sure that every young person is able to fulfil their potential, and that is our objective. Question number two has been withdrawn. Question number three, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consultation it will undertake with COSLA and individual local authorities on the COVID-19 strategic framework that is currently being developed. Deputy First Minister. President, Officer, the strategic framework is the means by which we set out our overall approach to the COVID-19 response in Scotland. It explains what we are doing and why. The update which the First Minister announced in Parliament will be published in the coming weeks and will be the first update to set out the, in detail uh, the approach that we will take to managing the virus in the medium to long term as the virus starts to exist at more manageable and consistent levels. Um, we will engage with uh, COSLA and also the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives and individual local authorities uh, on the development of the strategic framework in advance of its publication to Parliament. Paul McLennan. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. He will know that local authorities have and will continue to play a vital part in our recovery from the pandemic. Can I ask him how often this guidance will be formally reviewed and what the process will be to do so? Deputy First Minister. There's two points I'd make to Mr McLennan in relation to that point. The first is that we've worked very closely with local authorities on the formulation of the COVID recovery strategy. It's uh, essentially uh, a strategy developed between the government and local authorities. There is a programme board chaired by myself and the President of COSLA which monitors the progress on that plan. So I hope that reassures Mr McLennan and Parliament that the government is working closely with local authorities in that respect. In relation to the strategic framework, what we hope to be able to achieve with this uh, strategic framework is uh, a document that lasts for a sustained period of time because we hope to be moving into a more consistent period for the handling of the COVID pandemic, which will require very limited revision. Uh, but obviously we will have to keep that point under review and that will be the subject of updates to Parliament. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, question number four has not been lodged. And we move on to question number five. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it provide an update on its plans to support disabled people, including people with a visual impairment, to vote in person during the 2022 local government elections. Minister George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Stuart McMillan for his question. Uh, the SSIs for the local government elections support greater inclusion. New measures include spending exemptions so events are more accessible to disabled voters. We also recently placed a statutory role on the Electoral Commission to report on the accessibility of elections. Longer term, the Scottish Government officials are developing an electronic, electronic ballot solution for those with sight loss and exploring how other technology may help. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply. And the Minister will be aware of the issues raised by members and representatives of RNAB Scotland of ensuring that people with a visual impairment can vote independently at all elections, starting with the upcoming uh, council elections. Can the Minister provide an update on the planning for this new technology to happen and training that will be delivered to lo local returning officers and also key staff? Minister. 
Thank you, President Officer. Technology will be important in overcoming barriers faced by sight, the sight loss community. We both attended an excellent event on audio devices in Forth Valley Sensory Centre in 2021. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, it was not possible to undertake all the in-person trials and training that which would have been required to introduce this technology at the upcoming local government elections. However, we are committed to introducing solutions which enable all voters to vote independently and will take action to implement solutions as soon as possible by continuing to work in partnership with people with sight loss and the electoral community. A supplementary, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Um, Minister, your predecessor committed to running some pilot schemes um, at by-elections to see which scheme would work best. Can you update the Chamber as to say, have these um, pilot schemes taken place yet? And if not, when will they take place? Minister. The honest answer at this point, Mr Balfour, would be to say that I do not have the information right here, right now, but I will endeavour to get that to you, and you and I can possibly meet up at a later date and discuss the matter. Uh, question number six, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government whether the COVID-19 certification scheme allows people who have received vaccines and boosters in different parts of the UK to demonstrate that they are fully vaccinated to meet requirements for travel or visiting events where it is a requirement of entry. First Minister. Uh, sir, sir, yes, that is the case. Our COVID-19 certification scheme allows people who have been fully vaccinated elsewhere in the United Kingdom to show either their NHS COVID pass or Northern Ireland COVID certificate for entry to events or travel from Scotland. Um, if someone has received one of their coronavirus vaccinations out with Scotland, they can upload official proof of vaccination from that country to their Scottish vaccination record through NHS Inform. This will allow individuals to receive a combined fully vaccinated status on Scotland's COVID status app to show for travel and domestic purposes. Sarah Boyd. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer because he will be aware that I raised the same issue with him on the 12th of January. And if you go to the NHS Inform website, it does tell constituents how to log a vaccination in England, which is by contacting the venue where they got the jab and include their Scottish pass code. And if that doesn't work, to phone the helpline. But it still doesn't give information about England, sorry, about Wales or Northern Ireland. So is the Deputy First Minister confirming that this is actually a four nations approach? and that what he's just suggested does actually work for my constituents who, as it happened, did actually have their vaccinations in Northern Ireland and Wales, but that's still not what the NHS Inform website actually says. Thank you. Deputy First Minister. Uh, uh, if, if Sarah Boyd would like to drop me a note with the details of this particular case, I'll have it specifically looked into. But the, the logic of my answer is that if people have had vaccinations in other parts of the United Kingdom, they can, can have that confirmed on their COVID uh, status app within Scotland. Um, the NHS Inform system should enable that to be uploaded. If that is creating a difficulty in these circumstances, I will have that explored and remedied uh, at the earliest possible opportunity. If Sarah Boyd would be so good as to give me that information, I will pursue that. And I have a number of supplementaries. Uh, first from Siobhan Bryan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government if those who received both vaccinations abroad will be able to have this, these verified on the Scottish Status App in the same way as it is available in England? Deputy First Minister. I, I think the only caveat I need to put into that answer, Presiding Officer, is subject to the, um, the, the nature and the approval of the vaccine that, has been, uh, that the individual has had. So, providing it's an MHRA approved vaccine, then I don't see an issue with that. Um, but that's the only caveat I should add into that uh, particular answer. And supplementary, Willie Rennie. This does still seem to be a problem. My constituent had one vaccination in Wales, another one in Scotland. Because Wales doesn't provide a QR code for a single dose, he's still classed as unvaccinated for mm. travel. He's followed the Scottish Government guidance. He's filled in the form. I have been in touch with the directorate who said he should fill in the form again, which he has already done. So he is at his wit's end. What can the Cabinet Secretary advise that he does? Deputy First Minister. I, I, again, the best thing I can suggest is that Mr Rennie drops me a note with all of the details, and I will have it looked at immediately. The, the, the logic of Mr Rennie's point um, is that the gentleman concerned has had two vaccinations. So that should be enough 
to satisfy the, um, the, the accreditation or certification on the COVID status app. So if Mr Rennie would be good enough to send me a note with that detail, I'll have it uh, addressed and remedied. And supplementary, Douglas Lamson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, volunteers like myself who took part in the Novavax vaccine trial still do not have the correct vaccination status displayed on the app. Those volunteers who have been boosted show them as having only one vaccination and not three. Can I ask the Scottish Government to look at this urgently now that fully vaccinated means having three vaccines because at present volunteers are being disadvantaged? Well, the, the first thing I'd want to say um, is, is to express my thanks to Mr Lumsden and to people like Mr Lumsden who have volunteered for these programmes, because we wouldn't be where we are today, frankly, without their generosity of spirit in doing that. Following that, it is therefore imperative that for individuals who have made that commitment, they should be properly certificated for this purpose. So I uh, will give Mr Lumsden the commitment that that issue uh, I'll, I'll seek some information on that uh, issue and resolve it as quickly as it possibly can be resolved. Question number seven, John Mason. Hey, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the lifting of some COVID-19 restrictions, whether it will provide an update on when it anticipates the requirement to wear face coverings in places of worship will be lifted. Deputy First Minister. President, the face coverings remain an important measure in reducing the spread of COVID-19, and they are required in most indoor public settings. However, an exemption applies from wearing a face covering for those leading an act of worship and for performers. This exemption applies if the person is separated from other people by a screen or maintains a distance of at least one metre from other people. We understand that many people are keen to see restrictions regarding face coverings removed entirely in places of worship, and we continue to engage closely with faith and belief organisations on this issue, most recently on the 26th of January. We are required by law to regularly review all protective measures that are currently in place, and our most recent review concluded that the regulations on face coverings remain proportionate. We will continue to review this regularly and have been clear that protective measures within places of worship, as in other settings, will not be in place any longer than is necessary. John Mason. I yeah, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And, uh, I think the churches and others would uh, totally accept that they should not be given any privileged uh, position. But given that uh, many sectors are arguing for, for their own part, not least schools, that they should be uh, lifted and not have to wear masks, I just would like reassurance again, I suppose, from the Cabinet Secretary, Deputy First Minister, that uh, the churches and places of worship will not be forgotten about. Deputy First Minister. Well, well I, I, I give Mr Mason that assurance, and I also express my warm thanks to those in our faith communities who have been assiduous at applying the necessary restrictions that we have had in place uh, and, as a result, have enabled members of the public to participate in uh, public worship, which uh, I acknowledge to be immensely important for many people within our society. Uh, I also assure Mr Mason of our determination to continue to engage with faith and belief organisations and to give the assurance that we will not keep these restrictions in place any longer than we judge to be appropriate and necessary for the su continued suppression of COVID. And supplementary, Murdoch Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, individuals attending places of worship are often seated in rows facing in one direction and very often socially distanced from each other. Should we not be getting to the point soon where it becomes an issue of personal responsibility, whether people choose to wear face masks in such settings as opposed to be, being required in law for doing so, particularly when we know that having to wear a face mask in some cases discourages people from attending at places of worship. Deputy First Minister. Well, I would, I would, I would certainly hope that last point isn't the case, because I, I, I think the, and, and perhaps my answer to this question might help to address some of those issues, that I would want members of the public who wish to take part in public worship to feel confident about doing so, which brings me to the first point of Mr Fraser's question, where is I don't think this question can really be left to individual choice because we are trying to create an environment in which it is safe for people who wish to, to take part in public worship, which, as I have said in my answer to Mr Mason, I acknowledge to be a very significant a, a commitment of individuals within our society. So I assure Mr Fraser that the, these issues are looked at carefully. We engage closely with the faith communities. The faith communities have been marvellous at working with us in applying these regulations and applying these in different places of worship around the country. And I thank them warmly for doing so. 
um, and given the assurance that we will not have these restrictions in place any longer than is necessary. And question number eight, Fiona Hislop. To ask the Scottish Government how measures in the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Bill will support their COVID recovery strategy. Deputy First Minister. So the Bill supports the COVID recovery strategy by embedding reforms in Scotland's public services that, though necessitated by the pandemic, have delivered improvements for people using public services. It also addresses systemic inequalities made worse by COVID. For example, the Bill maintains the possibility of remote registration of deaths and stillbirths and gives licensing boards the flexibility to hold remote hearings. It also extends provisions which allow virtual attendance at court or tribunal hearings. The option to communicate digitally may help people with limited mobility who are unable to travel or encounter difficulties in doing so. The Bill also provides additional protection for debtors with unsustainable debt and maintains provisions which have supported tenants and prevented evictions. Can the Cabinet Secretary uh, confirm that as every part of society and economy had to rapidly transform in the light of COVID. Some measures, for example, new digital legal transactions may need permanent statutory footing for these widely welcomed improvements to be maintained as part of COVID recovery, and that resilience and readiness for any future pandemic, severe variant or emergency will be part of every country's response as part of COVID recovery. Deputy First Minister. So the, the, the bill that is before Parliament for consideration aims to do two things. It aims to embed some of the necessary and practical steps that have been uh, appropriate to sustain public services during a pandemic um, and where there is an, a, a, an arguable case for that to be made permanent. The second is that the bill is designed to update the statute, the statute book in Scotland to enable us to be able to respond quickly to any future development of the pandemic, which could be of an acute and threatening nature to public health, with the appropriate safeguards and caveats in the bill to ensure that those measures are only used in exceptional circumstances. So the bill is designed to equip Scotland with the necessary legislation to take into account the experience of the pandemic, both in the dealing with the emergency situation and then also in dealing with some of the practical issues and consequences that arose from the implications of our decisions. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. That concludes uh, that portfolio question session. We will now move on to the next portfolio questions, which is net zero energy and transport. And again, if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or indicate so in the chat room by entering the letter R during the relevant question. I call question number one, Natalie Don. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what level of response there has been to the public consultation on STPR2. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. As of 9am uh, this morning, there have been 82 completed responses in relation to the public consultation on STPR2. I would like to encourage everyone with an interest in how we invest in transport infrastructure to get involved in the STPR2 consultation. I am also aware that every member of this chamber will have received details about the consultation and I would want to encourage members to share these with their constituents. The consultation is open for 12 weeks with a closing date of midnight Friday the 15th of April 2022. Natalie Dunn. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I was very pleased to see how the Scottish Government's strategic transport review will benefit people and communities within my constituency. I understand that STPR2 relates to national projects and programmes, not real enhancement programmes, and therefore some potential initiatives, such as the reopening of disused railway lines in Renfrewshire and Inverclyde, haven't made the final list of recommendations. But transport projects like this would still have real significant local benefit. How might such, such projects be taken forward, and what role can the Scottish Government play to support this activity? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, the transport recommendations set out in STPR2 for rail to focus on the decarbonisation of the remaining network, measures to increase the amount of freight uh, by rail and also to improve connectivity between our seven cities. However, uh, there remains a, a pathway for regional and local rail projects to come forward, which is subject to a strong business case being developed and suitable funding being available. A recent example of that happening was the reopening of the Leavenmouth uh, rail line. 
In addition, though, I can say to the member that the Clyde Metro recommendations represents a, a multi-billion pound investment, which, when completed, uh, could better connect over 1.5 million people to employment, education and to health services in the Glasgow City region, including those who live within the member's constituency. And we have a number of supplementaries, given the general interest in the subject, and I hope to call them all first. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The response to SDPR2 in the North East has been one of disbelief, disappointment and dismay, as despite the Cabinet Secretary's weasel words, it ducks out of duelling USAN, dispenses with the promise of a 20-minute reduction in journey times to the Central Belt, and fails to provide new stations at Cove and Newton Hill. Crucially, there is nothing about relaying rail to Ellen, Peterhead and Fraserburgh. So, Cabinet Secretary, a straight question. Will this government relay any rail lines north of Dice during the period of STPR2? Yes or no? Cabinet Secretary. Sign off, sir. Um, let me try to be constructive for uh, Mr Kerr uh, in these matters and uh, make it very clear to him is that the focus of STPR2 is national strategic projects, uh, which is why it sets out the national picture which we will take in terms of transport strategic investment. Uh, as I have just mentioned to him, there is a route through for local and regional projects in a way in which has happened in the past. And that will allow those projects, which he refers to in the North East, particularly on rail, that there is a pathway for them to be pursued, subject to the business case. That would not sit within STPR2, and the reason for that is because they are not national strategic projects. That's Excuse exactly me, why... Cabinet Secretary, could you resume your seat a second, please? I, I don't want all this second-guessing of the answer. The, the question has been asked to the Cabinet Secretary. Let us listen to the answer given by the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, please resume. That is why, President Officer, there is a process for local and regional projects to be uh, considered out with STPR2, which, as I mentioned, is a national strategic project programme. And that's why the projects which the member made reference to have a route through to be considered in the way has been the case in the past. A supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is aware that considerable sums and efforts have been expended to develop business cases for the reopening of railway stations in communities like Beta, East Riggs and Thornhill. These were submitted to Transport Scotland three years ago, and Transport Scotland refused to consider those cases because they said it would be a matter for STPR2. It therefore, it is astonishing that new railway stations do not feature in the recommendations, and the Cabinet Secretary seems to suggest they never were going to feature in those recommendations. So can you tell us why? They don't feature, and why have communities been left in limbo for three years waiting for STPR2 when there was no intention of taking these forward as part of it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I don't think that's correct in uh, the characterisation presented by uh, the member because over the course of the last three years there's been a very detailed programme of work in looking at a whole range of potential interventions right across the country that would be seen as being national strategic projects. Uh, some of those which have been ruled out are on the basis that they are not viewed as being national strategic projects. However, the very schemes that the member made reference to still have a route through to be considered, uh, subject to a robust business case being developed and presented for local and regional projects, in a way in which I just mentioned to Mr Kerr. A supplementary, Willie Rennie. Um, I think the sooner we get to more firmer proposals in the in light of what the Minister said, the better. I am keen to advance the proposal for a Newborough train station, which I think is strategically important uh, for Newborough, because um, it is disconnected from many other parts of Fife uh, and Tayside. It is a vibrant community campaign that is backing the bid. Will the STPR2 make that train station more likely? Cabinet Secretary. I am um, uh, at uh, uh, danger of repeating myself here, uh, and clearly Mr Rennie uh, must have heard my answer. There is a process uh, for local and regional projects, just like there was, for example, for the St Andrews uh, uh, railway station uh, development and also for Leavenmouth, which were not in STPR 1. Uh, they have gone through the normal process, which is for a local regional development. A robust business case has been put together, it has been considered, and it was then considered as being appropriate for investment to be made. You know, Leavenmouth is a, a £70 million investment, not just in uh, several new uh, train stations, but also in the reopening of a line. So there is a clear history to how these types of regional and local projects are taken through. They are not something that sits within STPR2 itself, but there is a route there, including for the type of station that the member made reference to in his constituency. And supplementary, Maggie Chapman, who is joining us remotely. Thank you. 
The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the excellent campaign for North East Rail and their ambitions to connect Peterhead and Fraserburgh to the rail network. These are currently the two largest towns in the UK without rail links. I have heard the Cabinet Secretary's answers to previous questions, and I do understand that whilst not explicitly included in STPR2, can I ask him, does he agree that such links are regionally strategic and will provide invalu will be invaluable for the economic trans transformation of the North East? And will he support plans to develop these links? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I, I recognise the Member's interest in uh, these, particular, uh, these particular developments. It is important that any uh, rail connectivity projects that are proposed, whether it be in the North East or any part, other part of Scotland, has a robust and detailed business case uh, supporting what would be a very significant financial investment. Uh, and there is a, a process for considering proposals of that nature. And I would certainly want to encourage the member and those stakeholders who have been involved in the campaign in the North East uh, to make use of the existing process which they can use for considering local and regional uh, transport investments of this nature. Uh, given that it has been successful uh, in a number of parts of the country um, over recent years, I see no reason as to why it cannot also be an effective process uh, for those in the North East of Scotland. Uh, question number two, uh, Pauline McNeill, who is joining us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government what oversight role it plans to take over the Clyde Metro project in order to support, it, to support its timely delivery. Minister Jenica Ruth. The delivery of the Clyde Metro will be transformational for the city of Glasgow and communities, towns and cities in the Clyde area. It is of national significance and it is one of this Government's strategic priorities as set out in the SCPR2 recommendations, which are currently out for public consultation. One of the early decisions needed following the consultation will be around the delivery model for the medium to longer term. Senior officials representing organisations which are likely to become involved in the delivery process uh, are already working together to explore suitable governance and oversight. A programme steering group will meet for the first time this month, chaired by Transport Scotland Chief Executive. Polly McNeill. Thank you. Last September, Council Leader Susan Aitken confirmed that the Metro was part of the plan to decarbonise Glasgow and indicated that it was a multi-billion pound project which would be funded in part by private investment. And last month, we learned from the publication of the second Strategic Transport Project Review that there is no final design for the Metro, no dates attached to completion and no known funding. Can the Minister tell me when we are going to see genuine progress on this matter? And is there a first? Is there a timetable for the first phase? Could you tell me that, which I understand is to the air link? Minister, I thank the member for her supplementary question. Um, I recognise very much so, having lived in Glasgow for a number of years, some of the challenges in the city around about connectivity. Glasgow, as she will know, has one of, I think, the lowest levels of carbon ownership in the UK and also some of the highest levels of pollution. So it's really important that we get this right. There are a number of recommendations within STPR2 which look at mass transit projects and this project itself can, of course, as the member knows, provide an opportunity for transformational change, particularly for poorer communities. Now, the member asked a specific question with regard to costings. An early estimated cost of the Metro project is of the order of between £11 billion and £16 billion, pounds based on the outturn cost of other comparable projects, with a timescale of 25 to 35 years to complete. It is going to need longer-term political leadership that she spoke to and a new approach to delivery. But that delivery model, as I mentioned in my initial answer, has not yet been agreed. So to the timescale question, I'm sorry I can't give her a definitive answer, but she will recognise in the answer to my original question that the Chief Executive of Transport Scotland will be meeting this month with the programme steering group. And I would very much hope that at that meeting we can get the timescales the member is seeking today. And a number of supplementaries. First from Graeme Simpson, who is joining us remotely. <coughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I've uh, listened to the uh, Transport Minister's earlier answer. Um, when I look at the, the map uh, of the uh, Clyde Metro, it's all rather vague. There is a kind of random squiggle coming out to East Kilbride uh, with a loop around the town. I'm not sure where, where that is or you know, what exactly the route is. When are we going to get some level of detail on, on all this. Minister. 
Uh, I thank Graeme Simpson for his supplementary question. Um, he is asking again about the specifics of something which I think has yet to be decided. But I would want to reflect that the Metro project itself is an umbrella term which looks at a level of public transport provision to serve and improve connectivity within the Glasgow City region. It is going to look at a vast range of um, transport modes existing within the term Metro in the GCR context, including, of course, subway, tramway, tram train and bus rapid transit. But I do not want to prejudge the outcome of the initial meeting which is happening later this month with the programme steering group in terms of the specifics that he speaks to. But again, as I referenced in my answer to Polly McNeill, I would hope we would get further clarity and detail on some of those specifics at that meeting later this month. A supplementary, John Mason. Hey, thank you. Hey, given that say, some 56 per cent of households in Glasgow do not have access to a car but rely on walking, cycling and public transport, would it be the government's hope that say, a Clyde Metro scheme it will reduce uh, inequalities and help people get to work and education more easily. Minister. I am pleased to say, Presiding Officer, that yes, I share John Mason in that optimism. That the Clyde Metro will create the opportunity to connect people, businesses and the communities of Glasgow and surrounding areas like never before. But most importantly, it will connect poorly served areas which tend to be in the more deprived parts of the city. That prospect is significant and exciting for us as a nation, and it's one for our major cities and, most importantly, for all the people who live in Glasgow and feel a disconnect, potentially, from their public transport opportunities. By developing a, th a thorough and accurate picture of social and economic needs across the region, we will ensure the phasing of the project is designed in such a way as to maximise its positive impacts on reducing inequalities and improving people's lives. Question number three, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to improve the safety and resilience of roads and bridges in the North East. Minister. The Trunk Road Network in Scotland is subject to an annual road safety review and measures are prioritised where they are expected to contribute to the Scottish Government's 2030 casualty reduction targets. Our network is made up of route corridors that are of strategic importance to the economic stability and growth and social well-being of Scotland. We work closely with local groups and stakeholders, engaging with local resilience partnerships, key businesses and interest groups. Uh, uh, Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, the Minister may wish to see an ambitious uh, strategic transport review, but my constituents will be far keener to see existing issues resolved. Uh, Transport Scotland said they will review the dangerous Huntley Tesco A96 junction by August 2022. Uh, can the Minister confirm this date uh, and will she visit the site to understand the dangers my constituents face on this rural road network? Minister Jenny Gilruth. Uh, I thank Alexander Burnett for his supplementary question. He will know that it is the responsibility for individual local authorities to manage their own budgets in terms of allocating the total financial resources available to them on the basis of local need. I would like to reflect, though, that the North East has recently benefited from rose investment in recent years. Um, additionally, we have seen £745 million of investment in the AWPR. He asked a very specific question um, with regard to a road in Huntley. I uh, would be more than happy to meet with him on that issue and to seek an update from officials regarding um, the outcome of the report he has requested. And supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has a law strong record of investing in roads in the North East, the City of Aberdeen Bypass, which opened fully to traffic in February 2019, was the longest length of road under construction in the UK at the time, and the programme for government commits to developing a programme of wider enhanced public transport improvements in the North East. So can I ask the Minister to set out what some of these are and outline the differences that they will make to the lives of people in the North East? Minister. One of the SDPR2 recommendations is rapid transit for the Aberdeen city region. and We awarded £12 million from our bus partnership fund to enable work to begin on the development of the system and also bus priority on key tra transport corridors. On rail, we have committed £200 million to deliver improvements between Aberdeen and the Central Belt by 2026. We will also be looking at opportunities to improve the reliability and efficiency of the Aberdeen to Inverness rail corridor alongside our commitment to decarbonise the rail network. This will build on the work already undertaken in line in recent years, including opening a new station at Contour. Taken together, these improvements will improve region-wide connectivity and increase capacity for both freight and passengers. Question number four, Neil Bibby. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve bus services in the west of Scotland. Minister Jennifer Ruth. The Transport Scotland Act 2019 provides local transport authorities with enhanced options to improve bus services according to their local needs. And following consultation last year to inform the development of the necessary secondary legislation and guidance, we will publish the analysis report in due course. 
the new community bus fund will also support local transport authorities to explore the full range of options set out in the 2019 Act. We are also committed to over £500 million of investment in bus priority infrastructure to tackle the negative effects of congestion on bus services. Neil Bibby. Thank the Minister for that answer. Today I met with council-owned loading buses who provide the best bus services in Scotland and achieve some of the highest levels of passenger satisfaction. It costs just £1.80 for a single ticket for a 16-mile journey from one end of Edinburgh to the other. Yet in Greater Glasgow and, uh, and the West, a journey of just two miles can cost £2.50. Does the Minister think this is fair uh, and acceptable? And if not, will she support councils in the West to use new Transport Act powers to take control of bus networks so that we can make bus travel in the Greater Glasgow and West area as affordable as it is in Edinburgh? Minister. To respond to the specifics of Mr Bibby's question, the Transport Scotland Act does provide an enhanced suite of options for local transport authorities, including those in the West, to improve bus services according to their local needs. And local transport authorities ask for flexible options so they can put in place what works for their area. And I reflect on some of the differences Mr Bibby has highlighted between different parts of the country. But nonetheless, the Act does give viable options for partnership working and franchising, replacing underused powers in the Transport Scotland Act 2001. It also gives wider powers, though, for local transport authorities to run their own buses, which sits alongside their existing availability to subsidise services. The Act is not restrictive in the way that local transport authorities can provide their own bus services, be that running of services directly or through an arm's length company. And supplementary flow from Claire Adamson, who is joining us remotely. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This week, around 930,000 young people across Scotland became able to benefit from the free bus travel. This scheme will have a positive impact on young people in my constituency, Motherwell and Wisha, particularly those travelling to college or university. In welcoming our tour post, can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the number of applications that have been received and the number of cards that have been issued? Uh, thank you. And obviously, we're looking at the West of Scotland here, Minister. Thank you. Um, Ms. Adamson asked a specific question with regard to an update on the under-22 scheme, presiding officer. I seek your guidance on whether or not I am permitted well, to respond. Well, please go ahead. But obviously, if there's anything you can say in particular about the West of Scotland, that would be most helpful because that responds to the question. By close of business on the 1st of February, uh, the Improvement Service reported that 123,038 applications had been submitted via their online platforms. These can take up to 10 working days to process, and not all applications are yet approved. But, by, um, but as you will be aware, the scheme is now open to all eligible young people to apply since the 10th of January. And we had the formal launch of the scheme on Monday, where I visited young people in the city of Glasgow in the west of the country. And remotely, we are joined by Paul Sweeney for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In Glasgow, the recently published uh, transport plan described that the effort to set up a franchising scheme would rely on untested legislation and cost the local transport authority four to 15 million pounds to build a business case and take at least seven years to implement. Now, I was rather disappointed to hear that lack of ambition from officers in Glasgow City Council. Would the minister like to engage with City Council and other stakeholders, including parliamentarians in the city, to try and ensure that we can achieve a franchising system for Greater Glasgow without those um, rather unambitious timescales? Minister. Um, I thank Paul Sweeney for a supplementary question. I am more than happy to meet with him and to engage with wider partners on this point, but I would reflect some of the points I made to Mr Bibby in response to his question with regard to the powers that already exist in the Transport Scotland Act of 2019. Thank you. Uh, question number five, Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives from the nuclear energy sector and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Uh, together with Scottish Government officials, I met with representatives of, from EDF Generation and EDF Renewables on Thursday, the 16th of December 2021. Various issues were discussed, including the end of generation at Tunderson B and the move uh, into defuelling the continued operation of Torness and the place of nuclear in the just transition. Further discussions may take place in future as required. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Hunterson B has shown what nuclear power can provide for Scotland – clean, reliable power to keep the lights on and keep prices low. As our nation is in the midst of an energy crisis, will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Scottish Government will invite an official representation from the nuclear sector to be part of that Just Transition Energy Commission? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, um, uh, when he's making reference to the Just Transition Energy uh, Commission, I presume he's referring to the uh, Energy uh, Just Transition uh, programme, which will go alongside our energy strategy, uh, and that will be a, a wider engagement. If there are members of the uh, nuclear energy sector who wish to engage with us in helping to shape uh, the Just Transition which will go alongside, report which will go alongside our energy strategy, I am more than happy to give them an assurance that they have an opportunity to feed into that particular process. Question number six, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports island communities with their connectivity to mainland or other islands. Minister. The Scottish Government supports the transport connectivity of our island communities through the procurement and management of the Clyde and Hebrides and Northern Isles ferry service contracts. In addition, funding to local authorities operating their own ferries was increased by £7.7 .7 million to £19.2 million in the current financial year. The Scottish Government also provides significant support to air services in the Highlands and Islands, including the air discount scheme, and continues to directly subsidise the air services from Glasgow to Campbelltown, Tyree and Barra, and to enable their continued operation. I look forward to meeting with the member soon. Um, I know we are due to discuss further matters relating to island communities, which he represents. Jenny Minto. I thank the Minister for that answer and look forward to meeting with her soon. Obviously, making sure that people are proactively engaging in the process is crucial to shaping how island communities are able to travel both to the mainland and to other islands, as has been raised with me this week by Jura Community Trust and the Jura De uh, Development Trust. Uh, um, can I therefore ask the Minister how the Scottish Government is encouraging community organisations to fully involve themselves in consultation processes? Minister. Jenny Minto is absolutely correct. We need to ensure that community views on ferry services input into decision making. I know there are a number of existing opportunities for feedback and consultation on services, including twice yearly consultations by CalMac Ferries on timetable changes and on regular engagement by Transport Scotland with local elected members, including through twice yearly ferry stakeholder groups and local ferry committees. Transport Scotland is also currently working with CalMac and the Ferry Community Board to see how the current timetable consultation process could be improved. I would be more than happy to discuss that with Jenny Minto. I know we are due to meet recently, but if she has views on how we might do that better for island communities and her constituency, I would be more than happy to listen to those and take on board actions from that. A supplementary, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Including free ferry travel in the under-22s bus scheme would level the travel playing field for young islanders with their counterparts on mainland Scotland. If the emphasis is to encourage more young people to use buses, what consideration is the Scottish Government giving to connecting and joining up island communities with fixed links? Minister. I think Beatrice Busher raises a really valid point. This week was um, extremely important in terms of the rollout of the under-22s um, provision. However, she, um, in her constituency, will have different challenges in that space. I recognise representing an island community. Um, there are no plans at this moment in time to widen the scheme, but let me take away her point today regarding some of the issues she has raised, because I recognise that bus provision in her community might be a wee bit different to other parts of the country. And supplementary, Roger Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask what support is available to Orkney and Shetland councils who provide inter-island ferry services? Their fleet is ageing and the cost of replacing ferries is beyond their reach. Minister. We have supported local authority ferries and we will continue to engage with council, including Orkney and Shetland. The Scottish Government has been clear that while responsibility for internal ferries sits wholly with local authorities, we recognise the funding pressures that this can bring. I note that Shetland Islands Council has submitted a, a bid to the levelling up fund for replacing ferry infrastructure for which they are responsible, and the Scottish Government is committed to continuing to engage on those important issues. Question number seven, Carol Mochen. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what additional financial assistance it plans to provide to help local authorities meet their net zero targets. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government works with local authorities to support and fund climate action across a number of key policy areas, including, for example, £2 billion Learning Estate Investment Programme, which is delivering digitally enabled low carbon schools and campuses, £200 million Green Growth Accelerator Programme, which is supporting investment in low carbon infrastructure. And only last week, we announced a funding, uh, funding to unlock £60 million for local authorities to invest in electric vehicle infrastructure over the next four years. Carol Malkin. 
I thank the Minister for the answer. Um, some councils, including the SNP-led Glasgow City Council, have stated that it will cost billions of pounds in order to bring housing in line with expectations. It appears the Scottish Government want councils to get the private sector to help foot the bill, but in smaller and more rural council areas where massive industry and service sectors are less prevalent, how is this possible? In South Ayrshire, retrofitting plans could cost as much as £575 million alone. So I reiterate, what will the Scottish Government actively do uh, to help this, uh, take this burden beyond the low-level support offered? Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, President Officer, the, uh, we recently published our heat and building strategy, which sets out a range of actions that we're going to take forward in order to help to support decarbonisation of both council and social housing uh, sectors. And within that record investment of £1.8 billion over the lifetime of this Parliament to assist that programme of work. However, as was also set out at the time, is that the level of investment which will be required in order to achieve this far exceeds what the public purse is able to provide itself, which is why we have also set up the, uh, green, uh, uh, the, the, the green Heat uh, uh, Finance Programme to look at a range of different, or task force, to look at a range of different options to lever in additional private sector investment to support what is a hugely uh, ambitious programme of decarbonising one million uh, domestic premises between now and 2030 and 50,000 at non-domestic premises. So this is a hugely ambitious programme that will require both public and private finance and the measures we have put in place with the strategy and with the task force are to help to address the types of issues that the member has, has highlighted. And question number eight, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you, sir. To ask the Scottish Government what impl implications the announcement of a hybrid model of working could have for Scotland's net zero ambitions. Cabinet Secretary. Any significant shift in the way we work could have an impact on emissions. Research commissioned by the Scottish Government's Centre for Expertise on Climate Change showed that the emissions outcome from, working, from home working at an individual level depends on the home type and commuting behaviour. In most instances, replacing a long car commute with working from home will reduce emissions, but this also depends on the heating system at home. Uh, the lowest emissions future uh, is best achieved through where our homes, workplaces and transport network are low or zero emission, and we are committed to supporting the transition in order to achieve this outcome. Stephanie Callaghan. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Hybrid working during the pandemic forced a necessary shift in working practices across the public and private sectors, triggering flexible thinking around the challenges and opportunities hybrid working presents. With so many emissions wrapped up in the daily work commute, can the, Minister, can the Cabinet Secretary detail what steps the Scottish Government is planning to monitor, quantify and evaluate the potential of hybrid working to contribute to this Parliament's bold and ambitious net zero targets? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I, I think there is no doubt in uh, my mind and from dialogue I have had with uh, a range of businesses, uh, including at a, a national level, that many of them will continue to utilise a hybrid working model um, into the future and beyond the pandemic, uh, given that they have had to put structures and arrangements in place in order to uh, continue to operate during the course of the pandemic. Uh, at this stage, it is still unclear as to the exact nature of the impact that will have on overall climate change uh, targets. Uh, potentially, it will be positive, uh, but there are a number of mitigating factors that could influence that. Uh, but the, well, at this stage, we do not understand the full details of that, and that is largely because of uh, the unique uh, uh, events we have experienced over the course of the last two years and the need to build up data and understanding of that. Uh, I've get, um, uh, one of the other impacts that we need to also understand is that the significant change in travel patterns has a significant impact on our public transport system, uh, which is geared up uh, uh, to uh, move a significant number of people around in any given day. And when those numbers drop back, it has a, then a significant financial impact on the fare box. So there's a number of uh, factors that will come through the change to hybrid working and for those who continue to operate in that model going forward uh, that will impact on our transport system and also on our cl climate change targets. And we'll have to model those and ident identify those and model their impact as we go forward so we can get a better understanding of their overall impact on our climate change targets. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.